Hello and welcome to Is This England, a show where we talk about old England games and ask just how England was this. Today we're covering a controversial match from England's 1966 World Cup campaign against old foes Argentina in more of a fight than a football match. More of a fight than a football match. Very much, isn't it? it 1966. Is. Yeah, it's a right load of fisticuffs, this, isn't it? I thought 1966 was just lovely blokes having a lovely good time. <laughs> Lots of cigarettes. Lots like, of cigarettes and it, happiness. Like, you can't imagine the amount of cigarettes kind of like sticking up <laughs> the nose and their eyes <laughs> coming out of everywhere, really. I think we... um. We seem to judge England eras by how much cigarettes it looks like the team smoked. But these guys look like they smoke less than the guys from the 70s. Yeah, I'd agree with that, actually. So it's like kind of on an upward trajectory. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say these guys eat more pie and mash. Yeah. Uh, less cigarettes. Coffee's not a thing yet. No, no. Tea. More tea. Oh, Christ, a lot of tea. Yeah. yeah. And uh, beer-wise, what are you thinking? Mild, mild. Actually, yeah, mild forever, I'd kind of say. <laughs> mild forever. Yeah, wine. Again, wine's not a thing yet either. Though. No one's got into wine yet. <laughs> even, even the women aren't allowed to drink probably at this point. <laughs> no. Oh, well, <laughs> well, shall we find it? I don't know. <laughs> no. uh, anyway, guys, yeah, so we're looking at uh, England versus Argentina from the 1966 World Cup before we get into all of that. Um, a little bit of a request from you all, if you can follow us on social media at isthis underscore England. That's across Twitter and Instagram. Um, if you want to email the show as well, uh, get in touch about anything that pops into your mind, um, as long as it's England related. Has to be. Has to be That's England crucial. related or it will go into spam. We have <laughs> our filters set up. Um, yeah, the email is isthisenglandpod at gmail.com. And I guess the all important one is five star reviews on your uh, podcast platforms, whether it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or some of these newfangled ones. Yeah, as soon as we get to those five-star reviews, the more stars England can start putting on their shirts. So it's up to you. This is up to you. You sat there at home with your little reviews. Just get on that, and then we can start getting those badges on England, because that's on you now. It's like the, um, we should do a, a promo video for it, like the Terry Venables one where <laughs> five stars just appears yes. as, we, as we finish the closing notes of If I Can Dream. Yeah, just finish that and then just, and send. <laughs> Let's get on with the show. We always start with a time capsule entry. This is where we take uh, a, an element, shall we say, from, mm. from the year of the game in question, and we put it into a time capsule, something that we can draw upon should we be starving to death in, in, in a <laughs> dystopian future where all memories are just like a microchip or something. Yeah, we need to make a physical one of these because elsewise it's in our heads. It's in our heads, yeah. <laughs> so I think we need to actually start writing this down as well, apart from our, and our show notes. Well, I'll tell you what, what's going to be in my microchip in my head in the future for mm -hmm. the year 1966? I think it's what we all remember from the year of 1966. Yeah. And it's the birth yeah. of... Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, he's, he's just burst into the world. He's just got to sort this place out. As he's only got a week. <laughs> he's burst onto the scene. He's just come out and gone, fuck me. <laughs> what's this shit? Come on, big boy, what's this? Yeah. <laughs> I know he's on his own umbilical cord. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking umbilical cord, yes. <laughs> anyway. Oh, it's raw. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all of his hits out the way there. Um, why did Buddha pick this one? Yeah. <laughs> This is the swinging 60s, man. And yeah. I'm like some little kid being born in Scotland who nobody knew until he became a fell mouthed chef. Now, I <laughs> love Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. I love watching his shows. I actually think he, he does come across as an all right bloke. Um, I know a lot of people don't like him. I'm guessing you do. Uh, I know you do, but for the purposes of the podcast, <laughs> I'm guessing you do because of all the quotes you put in there. What, what, what are your thoughts on him? Um, I was kind of introduced to him when I was at school and we were doing hospitality and catering and one of our teachers put on the original uh, UK Kitchen Nightmares. It was the... Wow. Wow. <laughs> and it was, the, uh, it was the first ever episode and it was that amazing one where it's that young... I think he's like a, he calls himself an executive chef. Yeah. And like he cooks him, it's something ridiculous. And he's like, 
that's raw, you idiot. What is this? It could have killed me. And he's like, oh, I didn't know it was fucking raw, did I? Oh. That bloke. Oh, is it the, the, the fuck? Is it, isn't he like half Polish, half Mancunian or something? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. He's got, he's just got a broad, like Northern oh, accent God. anyway. But that, that is amazing. And like, you like blindfold him in the sous chef and they've got to tell what's the difference between chicken and pot. I mean, I couldn't do that. Oh, mate, I wish I wished I could just quickly find that one. Uh, there's one, it might even be the same episode, actually. Mm. I swear the guy's like Polish, but has lived in Manchester for years. And like his boss, he's the chef, but his boss is like a proper ego driven bloke and he just won't oh, okay. take anything from, from him. And he won't take anything from Ramsey either. And this guy just goes, ah, kid, you've got to <laughs> shut your fucking mouth. Oh, that bloke. Yeah, yeah. I know the one you're on about. you got like a tapas restaurant. Yeah. yeah. And he's got a tapas one. He's like, oh, we've got little little like things that come in with live music. And he's like, he's not interested, mate. He's here to save your job. <laughs> it's better than this shit that I'm fucking cooking. <laughs> Talks of fucking shit. He's just got no time, but he's, he's kind of reached breaking point, that bloke. I mean, oh, yeah. And that's why like UK Kitchen Nightmares is genuinely like a, a thing that I have rediscovered over the last couple of years and, and really love. I really, I'm not asked for the US no, one. It's, it's so, too, it's so hard to watch because it's just so many breaks and like after recaps. the breaks yeah. chef ramsey makes a shocking discovery and yeah. it's the music over the it music. It's, too, it's like too trying to be tense but actually there's no tension whatsoever in it with the uk one there's elements of like the office or something because of that yeah. lack of music and the silence just hangs there and 100 percent agree that was a way better for it it's a shame that there's so many of the american ones and so few of the uk ones i think there's like maybe four seasons of, yeah. um, it's, it's weird because on like certain TVs you can't get uh, 4OD. So whenever I uh, visit my mom's house, we all, uh, every now and then I'm like, oh, I may just stick one of these on because, you know, we're just kind of like chilling and whatever and it's easy watching. And like some things just don't have all the episodes on. I'm just like, well, where is it then? Yeah. But, Who's got the definitive um, collection? Yeah, the back catalogue. I know. Yeah, but I, I, lo I love it. I thought I, I'm, I'm a bit indifferent with him. I know kind of at the start of the pandemic, he like pretty much everybody else in kind of in the hospitality industry just absolutely panicked and just sacked all their staff, which kind of he did, but I guess he's no different to anybody else. But yeah, I, I, that for me, that show has made me really appreciate that he did care at one point. I don't really watch a lot of his newer stuff. I think I'd catch a bit of it every now and yeah. then. But he's just like doing, he's like Ross Kemp or something, isn't he? But less, less well, he investigative. Does, he's just, oh, I'll ride around on a motorbike for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does a lot of those kind of like him and a couple of other blokes go on a trip. And yeah. like, it's it's like Top Gear with food, basically. Can't be asked for any of that. Yeah, I've, I've never really watched many of them, but I've, yeah, I've, I've heard they're all right. But he's yeah. worthy this of is, a, This is the gold. Yeah. <laughs> he's worthy of a, a uh, slot in our time capsule just, just for the UK Kitchen Nightmares alone. Had a little bit of a football career as well, didn't he? Oh, he likes to say so. He was like, he had a trial at Rangers and he's definitely like, I used to play for Rangers. <laughs> I thought he did. And I'm clearly Scottish because he's always on the rest of the world team uh, when they play England in <laughs> soccer, eh, don't they? He's like always there. Be like, yeah, yeah. I am a right back. Yeah. I keep <laughs> yeah, my yeah. place here and I will do a solid shift. Fucking press. Yes. <laughs> Just him, Will Ferrell, and like Seedorf. <laughs> it's just like the strangest collection. I think we need to do a soccer do. game at one point, don't we? Yeah. That'd be so funny. Do one where Robbie Williams plays or something. Oh, was it Jonathan Wilkes? His mate, he's the star. Ben yeah. Shepard used to be good at those as well, didn't he? Yeah. Do I think me? I watched the most recent one, or I watched a bit of it, mm. the first half. And, you know, there's people from, like, YouTube and that, and you're like, oh, really? is this just a bloke? <laughs> I don't know this bloke. <laughs> Where's the rate my takeaway bloke? I want to see him on oh, there. Oh, my giddy God. They've got Chunks, and I don't know who he is other oh, than that. I know the name, and I'm already cringing, so. Yeah. I think rest of the world had um, had some good players. I can't even remember. I think Carragher was playing for England. Ah. Mm. Oh. There was a there was somebody who just retired playing for rest of the world. Yeah, it's a bit cheating, that, isn't it? Yeah, really? yeah. Oh, fuck, I wish I could remember. There's always was. that one presenter for um, England who's always in goal. I can't think of his... Jamie Feakston. He's always in goal for <laughs> yeah. some reason. Because, like, David Seaman does the first 20 and then it's like, well, I can't do any more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Usain Bolt, you'll find him knocking about as well. Oh, he's always there, isn't he? That was who it was. It wasn't for the rest of the world. It was for England. It was Mark Noble. Mark Noble? <laughs> yeah. Has he actually retired or is he just like, I can't not play for the Amers? Yeah, I think I think he's retired. He's fully gone, has he? I thought he just like they'd gone, well, you're going next year. Yeah. And then when next year came around, he was like, well, maybe I'm still all right. <laughs> I mean, well, that was not a bad play. I think he'd get a game somewhere else, really. But he's like, if I'm not at the Amers, I think that's, I'm not I think playing. that's his attitude because there was all these emotional 
farewell videos on Instagram. Yeah. And Pep was saying how much he was, how much he <laughs> looked. You know how he does that weird shit where he's like, yeah. oh my God, he's the greatest. <laughs> he's the best player ever. He's just like saying, to be fair to him, he's right. Players like that don't happen very often, if at all anymore, where it's one club, you know. Yeah. But uh, what's yours? We've gone from yeah. Gordon Ramsay to Soccer Aid. <laughs> Somehow. So uh, year's 1966 and I am putting in Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. Something a bit more traditionally associated with the 1960s than... Yeah, I'd you say You don't say so. Gordon Ramsay to someone and they go, is he that bloke who was born in the 60s? <laughs> was he born in 1966? <laughs> the most, you know, famous thing that happened that year. But uh, yeah, one of the definitive summer albums, I think that is. I think that's fair. I think that's yeah. fair. Uh, Brian Wilson, uh, the genius behind the Beach Boys' best material, to total creative control, uh, handling the songwriting, production, arrangements, and the bulk of the lead vocals as well. An incredible album. After he'd gone off his tits completely, yeah. <laughs> way into the deep end, and uh, comes out with something beautiful. He kind of goes mad even more after this as well, doesn't smile. he? Smile. Yeah, it was smiley smile, different smile, whatever. That, yeah. yeah. That, just, that becomes very messy and murky, and yeah. I'm never quite sure what's what of that period. I think the definitive one is the one that came out in about 2003, and it's like, this is actually finished now. Yeah, I, I'm taking a lot of my knowledge from that, from the biopic, obviously. Oh, okay. So, really um, good. Which really it good was uh, Paul Dano played the young uh, Brian Wilson in that, which is which is great, and he's great in that too. Um but yeah, uh, definitely one of my favourite albums ever, Pet Sounds. It's fucking, it's so beautiful. And the songwriting is so incredible. Mm. And as somebody who plays a little bit of music, mm. if I try and, those songs sound easy because they're so easy listening and everything like that. But if you try and play them, they're really complex in terms of the chords and, and the way the songs are structured. And then if you think about the harmonies of the vocals on top of that as well, it's really, really, really like, incredible music it's almost like a textbook yeah for how to re um teach music but like, this is this is just what works I'd, I'd like to see you try and do all of the instruments at once because at one point they had 40 musicians um during the periods which is just like madness yeah, 40 instruments that's like that's like 10 octopuses <laughs> yeah well the 40 session musicians they bought like animals in as well to record yeah. some of it it was. It's just amazing, really. I imagine you trying to play it on, you know, those videos of, like, people on YouTube or whatever, and they've got, like, a pedal, and they're also ringing a bell, and they've got a guitar and a hitting something, and they're yeah. also playing the piano, and there's, like, a whistle going as a well. One-man one band style. Yeah, but they're 40 just, of them. They're stressed out and sat down. Yeah, you well, do that he, because... He's mapped every element of it out, all those little percussion bits, all the little, like, left and right panning, and it's so good. Do you like the Beach Boys' earlier stuff? Um, I do, yeah. It's a bit similar to kind of where you look at the, the Beatles earlier stuff where it's just like, this is very just easy pop music, but it's probably better pop than anyone else is making. Yeah. And yeah, I do like it. I just think there's there's nothing quite like this when it gets to this period. I mean, you look at, um, as mentioned the Beatles, they kind of started inspiring each other in this period as well to make more music and make better music as well. Yeah, it's that, it's that famous sort of trade-off, isn't it, where I think Paul McCartney heard... Uh, God Only Knows off this album. Yeah, so um, Wilson had been quite... listening to Rubber Soul and said that he sat down and tried to write something of that ilk and he sat down and he wrote God Only Knows, ah. which Paul McCartney then said was his favourite song of all time. Yeah. So they then recorded Revolver on the back of that. Yeah. And then he heard Revolver and was like, I don't know, it was the same year as this actually. So they had already kind of, Revolver was what one of the tunes that they caught out of that. And then... At the same sessions with Pet Sounds, when they listened to that, they then went on to write Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band because then they Ooh. kind of kept trading it off as they well. Are, yeah, they are kind of running away with them. Um, the Beatles are kind of running away with oh, at yeah. that point as well. Brian Wilson's like fucking in a straight jacket or something. <laughs> on his own because all the rest of the band are just like, let's just do our own tunes. Have you seen him live? Uh, I have actually. I saw him in Digbeth a couple of years ago. I saw him at the Town Hall, Symphony Hall. Okay. Yeah, well, he's... A few years he, ago as well. He, um... He's had a hard life, hasn't he, Brian Wilson? I think I'll it, say that. It was emotional. Yeah. Um, I love I loved it because the whole band were great. He was there in terms of like you still had that voice who wanted to be there. And he's I think his son may have sung vocals actually. Yeah, there was definitely a bit of that. Um he was almost like a a a, a symbol of himself, yes. if that makes sense. Yeah. And people knew that though. There was a lot of love. Yeah. A lot of like standing ovations for, you know. If you're taking it completely on its merit and being cruel, you'd probably go, that wasn't a fantastic vocal performance. Certainly not enough to make everyone give you a standing ovation, but it was like accumulative. Some people were probably thinking it's the last time you'll ever... And it, 
yeah. tour. Or, I, you know? I think it was similar. I, I saw Diana Ross at Glastonbury a couple of weeks ago, and I don't, you know, her voice isn't what it used to be, but similar to Pet Sounds and Brian Wilson, these songs are so undeniable. As long as someone is playing them, you just don't care. Yeah. And that's like it's testament to the music itself. Absolutely. Just uh, still on the beach, boys. Um, <laughs> If the earlier stuff, there's a, a compilation album called Endless Summer mm. that I picked up from a charity shop when uh, I didn't have a, like a digital connection in my car and she used to buy loads of CDs and it's amazing. Okay. And it's just greatest hits up to Pet Sounds. So it's just that whole era. Okay. But without the, there's a lot of repetition. A lot, about, a lot about surfing. A lot about surfing. <laughs> uh, here we go. First three songs, Surfing Safari, Surfer Girl, Catch a Wave. <laughs> Number five, Surfing USA. <laughs> but, Amazing. Every single song on there is brilliant. I think there's about 21 songs. I'll have to check that out. Then. You should, yeah. I think 21 songs are prob probably about, yep, 46 minutes in length. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they've got that down to a T, haven't they, at that point? It's not too much of a time commitment, unlike this podcast. 15 minutes in. <laughs> 15 minutes in, and we talked about the Beach Boys and Gordon Ramsay. I think Gordon Ramsay is a better indicator of what we're about to talk about than the Beach Boys is, if I'm, if I'm honest. Yeah, we're covering... Yeah, it's like... <laughs> The 60s isn't all peace and love, you know, oh, man. No There's way. some absolute brutes being <laughs> born into this world. And who knows, maybe if Gordon Ramsay, maybe this game was on, you know, when 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 he was a little, yeah, just maybe. a little baby. You haven't got his birth date, actually. Maybe I, I have, maybe I have. And, 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 and it's after. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Maybe it was like kind of, they were had it on in the background, in, yeah. in, you know, in the womb. It was like, fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> because it's quite an angry one. Oh, uh, I think we've alluded to. Yeah. Um, why did we want to pick this? Because I, I didn't know it was angry um, when, when we chose it. Yeah, yeah. So um, why we picked this game today is because it, uh, today on the release, it happened 56 years ago today. We finally got an on this day yes. of one of these, not one of these little... 56 as well. I know, that's yeah. A, that's, that's an anniversary everyone wants to mark. <laughs> well, when are we going to be able to do that again? Yeah. But uh, yeah, and it, it's summer, should be peak of the World Cup time, really. We sit here and it's nice and sunny outside and hot and we just think, oh, imagine if it was the World Cup. Oh. But... It's not, but we've got to pretend that it is right now because we've got a huge classic World Cup game that is, as you say, controversial to say the least. Yeah, uh, the state of football at the time then, there's not really much point in talking about anything else other than the fact that England are hosting the World Cup. Yeah, it's the most important thing in the world, isn't it? Yeah, it's the most important thing in the world. And this is a, a first and, you know, you know what I always say, Nick Nick? England does it better. Yeah. <laughs> You've got that tattooed on your arm, haven't you, as that's, well? That's going to be the first, is this England merch? England, <laughs> England does it better. See if, you, see if you don't get your head kicked in abroad wearing that. No, yeah, even here doing that. <laughs> but this was the, a first. This was the first World Cup broadcast in colour, mm -hmm. as well as, more importantly, the first World Cup to have a mascot. Yep, and that mascot was World Cup Willie. It's a, it's a nice little song. It's the World Cup song for that year, which is World Cup Willy. Ah, uh, okay. You okay. will recognise it because I once proposed it as our intro music and you're like, this ain't bad. And then the chorus kicks in. You're like, ooh, <laughs> I'm not listening to that every single time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love, just a quick aside. Mm. I feel this might be a long one, by the way. We keep <laughs> having chats on the side. But uh, I love our, our um, theme song. Yeah. I listen to it on its own. Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah. Come back from the pub and just, yeah, whack this on. Jen loves it as well. It's so <laughs> it's so flipping catchy. <laughs> Head Over Heels by Kevin King. And by the way, if anyone that hasn't been able to figure it out yet. You can find that on all good streaming sites and whatever. Surprisingly, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's on like Geordie songs. I've got it on <laughs> or something like that. Geordie. The the Geordie classics, The man. best of Geordie music. <laughs> yeah. Knopfler, Fender, Keegan. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this this was the first World Cup with a mascot, as we heard there, a little bit of World Cup Willie, which is quite a Scottish name. For a yeah. William. World Cup William. I mean, were they just going for WW, basically? Yeah, World WW. Cup w. W. Yeah, well, yeah. Worldwide internet. <laughs> uh, but it was the eighth World Cup, 1966 was, so the first with a mascot, but the eighth World Cup mm -hmm. overall. That's a... Uh, 
I don't know. I've never thought of it like that. Yeah, to be so late almost. Like, like do you think that's too many, too few? I, in my head, that's too few. I felt mm. like it was more established for England to have won one inside the first 10. Mm. Uh, it, it kind of takes away from me. <laughs> but can anything else take away from that victory? We'll find out. Wow. Uh, the first <laughs> World Cup was held in 1930 in Uruguay with the hosts beating fellow South Americans Argentina in the final, an all South American final. Mm -hmm. That'll come back in a bit. <laughs> uh, Italy repeated the feat of the hosts winning the tournament in 1934 and again won the tournament on European soil in France the next time round. Uh, due to circumstances, the next to take place was in 1950, with Uruguay beating Brazil in Brazil at the Maracana, a game we've spoken about quite recently. Um, yeah, one of yeah. Brazil's big shames. Yeah, one of the two, isn't it? One of the two, one of the two yeah. that's really remembered. One more recent, but yeah, that was that. That was seen as like a national tragedy. I think that may have been even the the game where Pele was watching it with his dad at the final. Yeah, and his dad was in tears, and he was like, "It's all right, Dad. I'll go and win it's the World Cup." <laughs> Could you imagine your, your son coming up to you when you're like? crying at that he's like shut up yeah didn't oh yeah happen. will you really it's an absolute didn't didn't happen is it you know yeah. when the guys i'm like on twitter go my daughter i'm so proud of her she stood in the line at voting yeah. today and went tories out they don't <laughs> think about the real people and everyone applauded yeah it's one of those isn't it and it's pele as well notorious liar yeah <laughs> i bet if his dad were alive to hear him mate they're like no you didn't no you didn't i give you a big slap and you ran away <laughs> you little freak <laughs> <laughs> Your goal scoring freak. Uh, do you want to continue the World Cup timeline to bring us up? Yep, West Germany beat our Hungarian hunks in 1954 in Switzerland. Stitch up. Yeah. How did that team not win a World Cup? Eh? It's disgusting, isn't it? Uh, yeah, which was then followed by Brazil winning back to back titles in Sweden and Chile. Uh, yeah, so the first eight editions we have South Americans hosting three tournaments, winning four finals. And with three European winners hosting four tournaments, so pretty even here as we go on to European soil again. It is, yeah. Do you think? Do you think it was seen as competitive? Uh, I, but, I, I couldn't even tell you who's won what continent has won more World Cups now between the continents. You mean? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think there's already this burgeoning like, well, when we get you over here, because there's a big rivalry between. I think there's more rivalries between South American sides than European sides in general today. And. Uh, I would say that South Americans, though, when they would get together and actually, and we'll talk about it in a minute, when they see something's not right, they're like, well, we're buddying up with you because, yeah. you know, you're an, you know better the enemy, you know, and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so from, from our episode when we covered uh, England versus Hungary in 1953, we did find it was a lot more difficult to do sort of the admin around this time and all sorts mm. of tricks could be used to influence matches. It's almost a bit of trial and error and you, you don't know you don't know, even know that there's a, a flaw in the rules until it gets exposed by someone. Yeah. An example would be, as we mentioned about, even, this isn't even a flaw in the rules, but it's no. just an example of maybe we need to address this. Um, in Was it the final mm -hmm. uh, when Hungary played West Germany? Yeah. And uh, they had, the, the Germans had interchangeable screw-on studs for the weather. Um, and it was just, it just helped them gain that, what we'd call, I guess, minor advantage these days. But... A big advantage it turns out to be. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and like you say, you don't realise something's wrong until it's right there in front of you. Like we always say about the back pass rule, watching games is so, so strange. Yeah. And like it took until that went away when you just go, well, you watch a game now. And in this game, for example, there's an incident where the ball's passed back to a, a goalkeeper and everyone in the stadium boos. Yeah. And, you, and it's just like, even then people thought that was dirty, but it took until like 92 to outlaw that rule. I don't know if they thought it, of dirt, uh, thought of it as dirty. I think they thought of it as cowardly. Yeah, but then like their own keeper will do it and they'll be like, yeah, brilliant. And it's just like, yeah. well, and I know it's you know, hypocritical and all that. And that's what football is. It is just people being hypocritical, but it's still them. People don't like it when other teams do it. And you go, well, there's clearly a way of getting rid of that. Yeah. Well, uh, as we mentioned, in terms of the state of football, there isn't much else to talk about other than it being this uh, World Cup in England in 1966. Uh, no spoilers, guys, but mm. wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think <laughs> you, you may know at least the result of today's game. Yeah. Um, but we've also spoke about the times and the difficulty of those times and the sort of controversy. Um, as we go through to the game, there's going to be a lot of talk about those controversies and those mm. conspiracies and we're going to take a look at some of those and see see what we think with all these, you know, all these years that have passed in between. Uh, the tournament hadn't even begun, so 
the big the big the big deal is going down now <laughs> and typical of England it's not going smoothly there yeah. is talk of uh conspiracies right from the get go yeah absolutely and no better place to start than the brazilian conspiracy yeah. <laughs> i feel like i'm on like x files or something where it's just like well let's lift this up <laughs> yeah let's see what the hell's under here now we all know about the brazilian <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> But have you ever thought about it in this way? Yeah, what's, the, what's the Brazilian conspiracy then, Nick? So, yeah, r relations with Brazil first became strained when a BBC crew was sent to Brazil to report on the team's preparation, but were quick, quickly accused of being spies and had their <laughs> van attacked. How quickly? Do you think before any questions were asked? Just like, that's a van over there, get it. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> spies! <laughs> Just one camera. That's like, so... as, a, as, as a camera, I don't know that journalist, they're a spy. Do you think it was the players attacking it or, or Brazilian fans? I think it was the players. They were just like, we don't want cameras around here, let alone from a place where we're going in a couple of months to be part of a World Cup and maybe you know defend a title again. Spies? I wonder whether they had that sort of reaction. Uh, maybe not many other countries had that level of news broadcasting power that yeah, England had. Yeah, I'd agree. So they wouldn't bother sending a TV cam uh, crew over to report. Yeah. Um, the Brazilians also reacted with concern and distrust when it was announced days before the World Cup finals began that mandatory dr drug testing would be introduced for the tournament. Now, why would you be uh, annoyed concerned about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a red flag straight away, isn't it? Well, we're annoyed that there's drug testing going to be happening. Why? Well, no reason. Well, their reason. Uh, they said it was unfair that England's team doctor would devise the testing. <laughs> I can kind of see that. Yeah. Have an impartial party in between. Yeah. Um, because it's not... Not testing them for for skunk yeah. or, or smack <laughs> or things that are blatantly obvious. It's these minor perks, I guess. Um, the, the the Brazilian delegation wrote to the organisers to ask if the team were allowed to drink coffee, <laughs> stating that English players should be banned from drinking tea because, in their opinion, tea had higher stimulants than coffee. It's one of those things that you always hear. Well, actually, yeah, like people, a, people say over like furrowed eyebrows, and like, actually, tea's got more stuff yeah. in it than coffee. It, uh, you're having a cup of tea at uh, 10 o'clock at night, mate. <laughs> Good luck going to sleep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Night, night for you then, yeah. not. Do you want to you line a coke with that? <laughs> not just because it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing, that's all. I think that's actually an Alistair Green sketch. Oh, is that it? That whole thing there. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> so. Anyway. So they've accused, they have made a stereotype there. Yeah, straight away. And they've just been like, well, what are you drinking tea, aren't you? I mean, they were drinking tea, clearly. I mean, you had like, tea was still <laughs> being like drunk in... Football changing rooms in England, like until like the mid nineties. Why they didn't not drink it anymore for stimulant reason? Like. I think everything is just down to those like one percent about no no tea actually isn't going to help you yeah. and you need this and you need an energy bar or, or like a or, you know Lucasade what the hell they're going to drink? Yeah, Lucasade sports. Yeah, not actual Lucasade. Um, yeah, there's another bias against so Brazil are really they're really being perturbed by the rules that are thrown their way. Um, and, and I guess for the whole rest of the tournament, yeah, yeah, the other teams. But um, another bias against them is that they're only allowed to take two official photographers to each of their games. I mean, what a fucking, what a <laughs> hindrance to those players! Um, How are they supposed to perform when there are only two Brazilian photographers in the crowd? What did what, what was what was their threat that they that they made? Yeah, so instead they would threatened that if this wasn't changed, the World Cup would be reported on as a failure. <laughs> so you know, no bias Just, there whatsoever. And oh, yeah, oh what, you're going to write a. A, a bad article in Brazil yeah. about me. C carry on, mate. It's fine. It's <laughs> that, all good. That, that'll never come back in a podcast in 56 years of time. <laughs> What's a podcast? <laughs> never you mind. <laughs> give it five stars. Have, have they got five stars, Brazil? <laughs> uh, they must do, yeah. They yeah. must be the one team that's got five stars, haven't they? Yeah, so only to allow to take two photographers, they've gone. Well, if you only allow us that, we'll say to fail, yeah. And uh, good luck with that, by the way. Yeah. Good luck with that, by the way. It's not, it's not going to be a failure. It's a massive success. <laughs> um, that was rejected. <laughs> that that that, that yeah. appeal was rejected. Uh, basically, they went, go on then. Yeah. Um, and the Brazilian press said they would just take photos in the stands unofficially. I mean, a silly thing to say up front, because yeah. they just went, all right, well, if you're found doing it, you'll be ejected. <laughs> ah, well, yeah. not thought about this. You're going to pay for the tickets. <laughs> We're going to have to, aren't we? Unless you give them us. We're not going to give them, yeah? Exactly. So you're going to pay for the tickets? fine yeah do what you want well, well we just resolved it now if, if you see with a camera to kick you out cool it shouldn't be hard to spot i mean again how petty i mean and then this is on the journalist side as well so this isn't even the fa anymore whinging this is everyone else complaining about it too what possible issue could they have 
with just having two official photographers. I guess if they win, they can't have that many pictures to choose from. But it's from. not like you just are allowed to use your own photos. Like photos are still able to be passed around and used and the right, like, right copywriting's a thing back here still. Yeah, but this is pre-internet. That's my photo. You can't take my photo. Yeah, but pre-internet, if you want to get like a daily paper out or something. Mm. But you've got two photographers there. <laughs> you only need one picture though. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, a exactly. couple more. If he missed it, we'll just, oh, we'll just use another one. I don't get it, man. Yeah. Imagine if the players were just hearing about this and thinking, oh, m when we get out on that pitch, yeah. we're going to make up for that. Nobody takes our official photographers away from us. I could be furious because I won't have had my coffee in the morning either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming into the tournament then, how did all of this affect them? Uh, yeah, so it, it kind of continues on the pitch as well. So the reigning back-to-back -back world champions open their campaign with a 2-0 win over Bulgaria. Uh, but it's remembered due to Pele being kind of kicked out of the game through the brute force of the Bulgarians. Um, Pele missed the next game through injury, which was a 3-1 loss to hung Hungary, uh, having two goals disallowed in the process as well. So a bit fishy, they're saying at this point. Oh, Brazil lost 3-1 to Hungary. And I'd see, listen to that. Just, just a little peek behind the curtain. We've spoken a lot. And you're thinking, this is the year England won the World Cup. Why are they talking about conspiracies? And why are they talking about... Oh, who's won, more, who's won more, more World Cups, mate? South America or Europe? <laughs> well, so Pele comes back after that game, but again was kicked out of it after being felled by uh, Joe Moraes, who felled him again as Pele tried to stand up. That's two fouls in a second. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a lot to complain about there, in fairness. Uh, the player wasn't cautioned, and Brazil were then knocked out 3-1, claiming fell plays due, due to the two defeats being refereed by two English refs. <sighs> It's all starting to come together now, isn't it? People, we are through the looking glass. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I get essentially, essentially what, what we're getting at, mm. and it's interesting that we're playing Argentina, is that there is a pro-European conspiracy mm. to ensure that South American teams don't win the World Cup. Yes, Alex Jones, that's what we're saying. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's what's being painted at this point yes when we get to this stage of the world cup they are kind of saying there are complaints i mean i would say that this would not be the first case of people complaining about referees it would not be the last case as well <laughs> of, oh you've appointed this person we didn't want that referee we wanted this one like what well, i imagine like boxing's like well we don't want this going on here we want it over here because we're the bigger team or we get to call the shots usually when we have things in south america yeah, and, and it doesn't, the, the pain doesn't end there. I mean, the pain ends there for Brazil because they're out, but yeah. for the journalists, the poor buggers who have to report on it and the photographers, the pain doesn't end there. There have been press complaints about accommodation yeah. uh, and the amenities not working correctly with a Mexican journalist declaring he would go to the Queen if necessary to put a stop to these abuses. I mean, he wouldn't get far. No. <laughs> not going to let him in, are they? Yeah. Furious. I am a Mexican journalist. Let me stop you at Mexican, mate. <laughs> yeah. You're not, you're not 1966, in. you're not coming in, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I will literally shoot you in the street. Yeah, totally. And nobody yeah. will care. Totally out of character for journalists to just like see that their free meal ticket's going bad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, excuse me, these sandwiches are not big enough. <laughs> I mean, poor, poor Mexican journalists though, are coming over and having to have 60s English food. I know, yeah. Would, wouldn't be good, would it? I mean, we, we, there are other complaints as well. So you get um, training grounds that teams turn up to. There's no goalposts on at the start of it as well. I mean... It's hardly the first World Cup to be blighted by preparation. I mean, Walter Winterbottom would be so stressed at this point. Yeah. Who left the fucking goalpost behind? <laughs> he's only got one goalpost and he's got like three people who've got to carry it to each game. Yeah. just He's one like, of them. Go to a local like school and get the gymnasts out and like, right, <laughs> you need to like stand on each other's <laughs> shoulders and make a goalpost. <laughs> Poor Walter Winterbottom who, who did it all for England. He did. He chef, everything like that. I mean, I mean, this is like still not an old thing either. I mean, didn't Roy Keane leave the island set up? Because when he arrived on, it was Saipan, I think it was, that there was no football pitches on the island. And I tell you what, when England went to the World Cup in Brazil under Mike Bassett, um, <laughs> their balls got stolen by a bunch of, uh, no, they didn't. No, they got left in the Opal. Yeah, they got left in the Opal, <laughs> but they couldn't get the ball off the young Brazilian kids playing. I know, that that is a problem, isn't it? See, that's conspiracy right there as well. They only reached the semi-final and they went out to Brazil by memory. Oh, <laughs> it's all happening now. 
<laughs> oh, the plot thickens. I know. Um, more journal pain. A Swedish journalist um, wrote, this is the first report ever written by a journalist in a mouse hole. <laughs> I am wedged firmly between two planks and two cigar smoking Brazilians in yellow sombreros. Oh, are these the same ones who are fucking complaining? <laughs> All of that. Two planks and two cigar smoking Brazilians. Very harsh way of speaking about the Brazilians, calling them planks yeah, and cigar yeah. smoking. And two cigars. Are those the ones who, the, the, the sneaky <laughs> photographers? Oh, yeah. As long as he just smoke cigars in massive yellow sombreros oh, what they've got they've got those homer simpson sombreros the, the big hat the nacho hat with like <laughs> a camera in it yeah that mexican journalist would be straight over there as well having oh, a bit yeah. of nacho <laughs> yeah good on him good on him it's yeah. all it's all working out nicely yeah um and now it's on to our brave boys yes we come on to england uh as hosts england didn't need to qualify for the world cup and uh, they were on a run of one defeat in two years before the final so Really coming into peak form around this time. Um, it started slowly as ever, as we say, every single time they start a qualifying campaign, or a campaign for the World Cup, and they had an uninspiring nil-nil against South Americans, Uruguay. Oh, that's like one of those. Uh, yeah, last time where we started the World Cup with a draw, we won. Yeah, that's exactly what this is. It's a good omen. Elvis was number one, or whatever crap that is too. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay was born. Yeah, he was Every year he's been born, England have won a World Cup. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> that is so true. Uh, Uruguay were act. I mean, that it's it's an uninspiring nil nil. But previous, you know, winners twice. I think. Yeah, yeah. Good side to to get to start the tournament off with a draw against. I don't think you can really call that so bad. Um, after that, uh, they would go on to beat Mexico two 0 with Bobby Charlton and Roger Hunt scoring the goals. Hunt also had a goal disallowed uh, two minutes before Charlton's opener, so it could have been even sweeter. Yeah, I mean, there you go again. You know. Disallowed goal, you know, not, not really Not sure. everything's a conspiracy. Yeah, they've, got, exactly. they've got to make it look a bit real, haven't they? Oh, that's true. Or we'll disallow a goal here and there. Just, just chuck one in, Lino, put your flag up quickly. We'll get another two. England qualified for the knockout with another 2 0 victory, this time against France. Yeah, uh, Roger Hunt scored both goals for England that day as well, uh, with a debate regarding whether his first was possibly offside. Uh, and, oh. and no, oh. just, you just can't get away from it here. And it's like the second scored by, uh, while well, Jacques Simon was injured following an encounter with Nobby Styles, let's say. Uh, England themselves also had two goals decided for offside, one particularly seen as harsh. Do we know more about the encounter? Yes. So um, after the game, Styles was reprimanded by FIFA for the tackle, which he wasn't sent off for. Uh, Ramsey was told to drop Styles for the next match by um, the FA, uh, but refused and said he resigned before he would do so. So it must have been a bad tackle for FIFA to go. That was out of order. So Styles made a bad tackle, mm. uh, and a French player was injured. So he was injured whilst England scored one of the goals. Basically, oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! It's like it's like I don't know. It's like finding out wrestling's fake. Yeah, it's well, it's also like you kind of appreciate, and I hate saying this, kind of what VAR has done. Yeah. And you kind of go, well, because they're looking at every little bloody fanfare and all this other kind of stuff about everything that's wrong with a goal, you kind of appreciate it a little bit of like, you don't have a lot of this, but people can just go with the technology. That's offside. That's not offside. Yeah. It's black and white. You haven't got all this murkiness around it. Which so much murkiness, and that's the big thing. Which I do think, actually, back then, people just got over. But I think because now we've come through the age of there's a problem with everything, well, this has only happened because of this, not because this team was better and my team should have won because of this. I think people go back and look at this now and go, well, actually, th like that was offside, so that shouldn't count. That goal hasn't crossed the line. And now we've got more facts and black and whites around these kind of things. It's not as much of a problem, but here you kind of have that uncertainty still around it, which people bring up years later. Yeah, so uh, let's have a look at how Argentina, uh, how it came to pass that Argentina would face England in the quarterfinal. Um, a word of um, something worthy of note, actually, is that the teams had only met four times prior to the game we're covering today. Um, Argentina would win the previous meeting 1-0 two years before um, the game. Um, so it's not necessarily the big, big rivalry that we expect. Maybe not the needle that you'd come to expect. No, not at all. It's um, This game is kind of seen as the starting point of all that needle, which is, oh my God. which is quite interesting. They haven't really had much of a history, as you say. I mean, the 1-0 the loss previously two years earlier was in Brazil in a mini tournament that was known as the Little World Cup, where <laughs> Argentina won all three of their games against kind of the, the other, the other favourites. So you had England, Brazil and Portugal played in that tournament. A bit of a yeah. you know prelude to the um, 
a precursor, sorry, to the Confederations Cup. Or Le Tournoi. Or Le Tournoi as well, yeah, yeah. yeah. With that, Argentina entered the tournament as one of the more fancied sides and uh, came with a fittingly tough reputation. They opened their campaign with a 2-0, uh, a 2-1 win over Spain at Villa Park and uh, stuck around in the Midlands. Good on them. You're very welcome. You got some bad chips. No, com- <laughs> some bad chips. Battered chips. I was going to say, we do the best chips, mate. Obviously. Uh, yeah, they stayed in the Midlands for their follow-up game against West Germany, which ended 0-0 and was reported by the Birmingham Evening Mail as everything the World Cup knockers had been hoping for. A negative, petty, defence-locked affair. <laughs> now, who are these World Cup knockers? Yeah, I think it was, maybe it's the Brazilians. Oh. Maybe they just go, well, I told you the World Cup was going to be crap. Look at it already. Pele's dead. Yeah, <laughs> I told you it would be reported negatively, <laughs> even by the is. Birmingham Evening Mail. Yeah, they've infiltrated the mail, haven't they, now, in Birmingham? That's, um... That's, I, I think it's more people in England mm. going, why, why are we having this? It's a bloody idiot's game. Waste of money this is. You Waste of money. Spend your money down the pits instead and all, yeah. dripping sandwiches and all that stuff. We don't want that fancy foreign muck over here. Um, Argentina's Rafael Albrecht was sent off with 25 minutes to play in the game against uh, West Germany for kneeing Wolfgang Vuiba in the green. <laughs> uh, with Argentina manager Juan Carlos Lorenzo running onto the pitch to confront the match officials. Oh, that's not the last time we hear about that <laughs> kind of shit. I couldn't believe I was being sent off, said Albrecht. I thought my rugby tackle early in the game might have got me sent off. <laughs> I was worried about that foul, but I wasn't worried about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that just being like I was really sweating about that the referee was running after me for ages but yeah my goal was scored so I missed that <laughs> I was just like I was stressing about that tackle they made this one make up for it I really got out of my system yeah to be, to be sent off in this era I know it's like crazy is it well, is yeah. it that crazy? It's very hard. Let's say that it's very difficult. It's, yeah, if if you're playing fairly, mm, we'll see. And if all the cards aren't stacked against you, <laughs> all the cards hadn't been invented. <laughs> uh, West Germany's coach Helmut Schron said his side's standard of play suffered because many of the players were frightened. Too too scared to pass. <laughs> too scared to pass. Oh, he's going to kick me. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> but Argentina qualified for the second round with a 2-0 win over Switzerland to set up today's clash with the Free Lions. We're ready. Now, it does, there's a lot to get into. Yeah. Um, and we will start with the lineups for this European versus South American yeah. clash. Um England's lineup then. In goal, we have Gordon Banks. At the back, we have George Cohen, Jack Charlton, Bobby Moore, and Ray Wilson. In midfield, we have Nobby Stiles, Martin Peters, Alan Ball, and Bobby Charlton. Uh, up front, Roger Hunt and Jeff Hurst. Um, I think I heard on commentary this is the first time in the tournament they played the Winglish Wonders formation. I think so, yeah. It's definitely the first time we see this England team because this is seen as the England team, isn't it? That's the England team, yeah. Yeah, that's the one that everyone kind of knows. Um, I mean, you had Roger Hunt. He'd scored three goals previously in the tournament already, so he's kind of seen as the danger man Yeah. Uh, at this point. Um, the two changes England do make, actually, yeah, from the win over France. So Liverpool's Ian Callaghan dropped out for Alan Ball. So maybe he was playing like a bit of a similar uh, place to where Alan Ball does. Yeah, and uh, Jimmy Greaves, he's he's the, he's the uh, other unfortunate one to to lose his place. He started the first three games of the tournament, uh, but he missed this game through injury. In the uh, game against France, um, he had uh, an opponent studs raked down his shin, and he needed fourteen sk- stitches to close that wound up. Ow! I know. Yeah. Even back even back then, that's a big owie, isn't it? What are the loss, though, for the team? Yeah, I mean, he's not done much at the tournament yet, but an incredible player. I mean, already at this point for England, he's scored 43 goals in 51 games for England. That is an unbelievable record. Yeah. He's got goal, goals per game in this era as well. An incredible player at club level as well. That I mean, is incredible. I mean, he drops out because uh, Jeff Hurst plays, and I don't think there's a bench around these to this time either, so it's just a case of, yep, it's these guys, and you've got to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> got to deal with what? Yeah. Whatever happens. Fine. Yeah. Do you want to run us through the Argentina lineup? Yeah. Uh, in goal, uh, Antonio Roma and a back four of uh, Ferrero, Albrecht, uh, Perfumo and Marzellini. You have Antonio Ratin is the captain, George Solari and Alberto Mario Gonzalez, along with Onega, Artime and Oscar Mas playing for Argentina. Again, maybe there's a bench. There's no way of knowing. I don't know any of those names. 
No, before, Call me a Philistine. No, before the game, I knew none of them either. Uh, a few of them stick out to me now, obviously. But yeah, I didn't really know much about them at this point. But um, apparently they kind of come in, obviously, as one of the favourites and all that kind of stuff. But they're kind of behind the scenes. I don't think it's all going too well. There's a TV reporter from Argentina who describes Wembley Stadium as filled with chants of animals directed at the Argentinians before kickoff. Animals. I know, yeah. It hurts more than swearing. Yeah, that's it's dehumanisation, that kind of, isn't it, with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, as well, having previously reported on the two previous World Cups, um, he said that the mood had changed in Argentina's camp, saying, this is a very messy World Cup. He's not even played yet. Um, <laughs> I was going to say. The players have fallen out with the with the manager and the AFA president, uh, Val- uh, Valentin Suarez, has had to travel to England as a matter of urgency. So he's been called in to sort the job out now. <laughs> Not a happy home life. No. Uh, the kits then, uh, England, I mean, th- these aren't really kits. These are just like, what would you call them? They're just kind of bibs almost, aren't they? They're just <laughs> gowns. I mean, England's, it's just white. That's the only way I can really describe it. A normal human white shirt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't really mind Argentina. There's a little collar on it that's white that I quite like. It's, I like them both. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind them either of them, but it's like the Argentina one. It's like having, you know, like when like people have makeup put on before they go on screen, on set. Yeah, yeah. Little <laughs> things there so they don't get anything on the, on the costume. That, it looks like that, really, the little white collar, which I quite like. The more we do this, the more I appreciate just a really plain... Yeah, like there's some there's some really nice England ones, but when you see the classics and you're just like, yeah, just keep it plain, man. Yeah, I saw the other day on um on Twitter somebody had got the new Newcastle kit delivered. Yeah, and they put a complaint on, and it was like, um, at Newcastle, uh, my kit doesn't appear to have come with a sponsor. Um, what's happened here? Like I'm expecting a full refund, and somebody just commented on it and went, "I'll give you five hundred quid for it," <laughs> like because. Everyone would prefer it without a sponsor, wouldn't they, surely? I've, I haven't got my Saudi.com written across the arse <laughs> of it or something. It's like, well, good. Yeah. Uh, there's not no anthems to, to speak of, so let's get into the game then. It's England v Argentina, Saturday the 23rd of July 1966 in the World Cup, and it is at Wembley Stadium. Yes. Boom. And we are off. Yeah. As we as we kick off, I'm annoyed already. Yeah. Um, there's clearly a later dubbed version on the version that we've watched with uh, over the old style England commentary. It's like a Spanish commentary over the top of it, and it's clearly been done much later. It's, it's not been done live because there's no emotion in it whatsoever. Yeah, it, the, you can hear like the quality of the microphones as well. It's just mm. year. It's probably done years and years later, so we have to watch it in. Bloody Spanish. I know, but it's more annoying because you can hear the English commentary underneath it because you can, yeah. there's Kenneth Walthamstone and co comes Jimmy Hill. I'd have loved to have heard a bit of Jimmy Hill. Yeah, same. How old is flipping Jimmy Hill? When did he play? Um, it would have been around this time, I think. So I think he must, maybe he's not long retired or he's he's just um, around this period. Maybe it was just a case of, there's no one else. Jimmy Hill talks a lot, let's bring him in. Did you say that they mentioned Gaza later on in the comms as well? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the Spanish commentary does. Uh, they make <laughs> it's like oh so and so, so and so, Paul Gascoigne, and it's like what? <laughs> what? At least pretend you like you're old in and in the past. Well, it's like. Do you ever remember? I always remember this. A when Sky used to have the rights for the Bundesliga, but they never had the rights for like any of the commentary. So what they used to do when you had like these highlight packages is clearly the person commenting on the game knew the score and maybe knew the scorers, but he hadn't seen any of the goals yet. No. So the idea would be that he would pretend to do it live, but he could never quite like, yeah. and and Bayern continued to press here and they're rewarded, but he's actually missed it. And it's like the first that he knows the score and he knows there's another goal coming. How, how did they do it on match of the day? They do it live. And say, so it yeah. is live reported from there, but it, clearly they got like one bloke in a room to yeah. talk about through all the highlights, basically. And it's so annoying because, like, a Lewandowski soon completes his hat trick, but not here because <laughs> like, he misses a chance. Oh, that's or something. annoying. Spoilers. Yeah, it's awful. And, and again, that's what this game is. When you, I mean, I don't speak Spanish, but you can tell what's happening because there's certain incidents that happen and they're very relaxed about it. Yeah, and, and a few seconds in, we have our first foul. Yeah, uh, and it's seconds, isn't it? <laughs> and it's met with booze from the, the crowd. Uh, who do you think who, who's... You know, is it a boo from both sides of, of the crowd, you think? I think, from memory, I think it's an Argentina foul and an England player. And already the England fans are like, we don't like this, we don't yeah. like this at all. And the Argentinians maybe even... That's, not a, f- that's not a foul, boo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the early goings, I, I thought the quality of this game looked really 
really high. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Both teams were really strong. Uh, Peter looked good, very tricky, and Charlton was controlling the, the pace. There was an early shout for a penalty for, for a Alan Ball, but nothing is given uh, as the Argentina goalie drags him to his feet. Um, yeah, so it's quite quick. It's quite actually competitive, and the teams look really equal. Uh, one thing I noticed early on, uh, Nobby Stalls reminds me of Matt Hancock and now everything is ruined. <laughs> just of his appearance. Just, kind his, of like, just um, of his appearance, just that little... There's a bit of a, like, always looking up with the mouth open gormlessness about the Matt Hancock, <laughs> which isn't too dissimilar to kind of Styles at times. Because Styles is quite animated. I mean, when we watched the 67 game, I remember there was him and Dennis Law at one point. Yeah. And a foul was given and he was expecting it to be given to him. It wasn't, it was given against him. And him and Law at the same time just kind of like... Like look around at each other really quickly, and it's really comedic. It's the hair. There's something about it, isn't there? It's the hair. It's the the mouth as the well. Mouth. The mouth. Yeah, there is something there, isn't it? Unfortunately for Nobby. Yeah, that that lying mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we're not lying about what happens at seven minutes in. We have our first real bite. Yeah, uh, Argentina awarded a foul, uh, and Styles uh, runs into an Argentina player. Let's say. Uh, the camera cuts away and you can hear the crowd go up because something's happened, but the producer's not really caught it yet. And you can hear Jimmy Hill under his, uh, his breath, under the dub Spanish, start chuckling and, and it's already kicking off. There's always people surrounding the referee. I think yeah. one of the stills I put here, Styles is just pointing at all the Argentina players. When um, he tries to get back up the Argentina number eight, I uh, can't remember his name, mm. uh, Styles sends him back down. Yeah. Um, a bit of a knee, isn't it, already? Yeah, 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 because he's proper acting up. Like you say, he goes down in stages, doesn't he? And this yeah. is, you're watching this and you're thinking, oh my God, is this what we're in for? We're seven minutes in and there's already like big problems that are yeah. happening for the referee and the players. You're thinking, is it nature or nurture? Because, yeah. I've, you know, it, it's kind of a, uh, what what would I call it? A, a stereotype to say yeah. that about South American teams and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Oh yeah, definitely. That, that they act up like that, but it has been going on for all of these years. What, what else are you supposed to think? It still happens today. Yeah, it's seen as dark, and the dark arts is the thing that's always called, isn't it? And well, the crowd are already going off, 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 and like chanting for like it's like seven minutes. Like a referee is not going to send someone off in this era for that, like for anything really. No, no, because there is a bit of a tussle. You can't quite tell who started it like they both go in hard on each other and clearly something's happened we just can't see but yeah no one's happy at all at this point yeah but back to the action then uh there's a lot of misplaced uh passes early on i'll, I'll say the quality's high but that's more in terms of running and when they do have the ball at their mm. feet but passing i think as we mentioned in the 67 one if you could have if there was a player at this point and i know charlton probably is a good example but mm. you know who can really nail accurate passing then that's but, like a superpower. Yeah, they just stand era. out more and that, that team can kind of be carried by that yeah. person as well. Because it, it feels like it's all about the dribblers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I mean, that is a superpower in this era, isn't it? I mean, you, we saw um, that with the England 53 game as well. Um, one thing that's really strange at this point, um, Argentina look to break away and they play a ball over the top and Bobby Moore just stands up and just grabs the ball, essentially. <laughs> like it's going, <clears throat> it's going around him. And he just jumps up and just smashes it down like his basketball. The referee goes, yep, free kick. No card. No card, no nothing. And oh. it's just like, play on. He's like, well, that's, that's one of the examples of why is he not being booked? Why is yeah. that not a caution? That's bad. When you can just do that. Like, why aren't all the players doing that I didn't then? pick up on that. That's strange. Yeah, it's, it is really odd because, you know, when you don't really know what's happening in the game and you just like kind of, you watch it and your eyebrows just go, what the hell was that? Yeah, yeah. It's like, has there been a foul that he's, he's grabbing the ball? But no, the referee just goes, yep, free kick. Like the first time we saw a back pass when we were doing this podcast, yeah. I remember watching it at home. I was like, oh, oh no, it's okay. He's picked it up. That, that was a thing. <laughs> you were allowed to do that back then. Yeah. But, and, um, um, and I'll tell you what though, not just colour TV, mm. colour TV with graphics. Oh, we've got the egg timer. We've got a 15 minute egg timer. I didn't realise that that was around this era. I thought that was brand new for when we did the 73 game. Why did they put the modern commentary, but not like a modern scoreboard or a timer or something? Yes, yeah, like something. Like the person who's edited that since, like well, we want to keep it pure. But you've got two people who've like from, <laughs> from the future, essentially, commenting on the talking game. Talking about the internet and... and talking about like, Paul Gascoigne. Gascoigne. <laughs> Argentina get their first shot away, though. Yeah, their first shot in anger is a volley from outside the area and bank save for a corner. And, yeah, they're not really committing too many men forward, are they, at this point? They don't, they've got their, their tactical in the way of, we know what we want to do in this game to upset it. Yeah, I think it's really intelligent. I think 
that they kind of whether they know that England have a bit more of a tactical sort of uh, skill about them and they're just waiting and it's almost like an Atletico Madrid style performance and they're looking mm. for a 1-0. I don't know, but yeah, they're not committing too many men forward. I don't think they feel the need to. It's not just run the ball up the pitch as soon as you get it. Yeah. it it's kind of well considered. England are kind of run the pitch up the ball, the ball up the pitch as soon as you get it, but just in a way that is quite effective. It's yeah, not just well, hopeful. They've got one of the great dribblers in Bobby Charlton really, haven't they? And they're, they're always looking for that ball over the top too and we've not really seen... The only bad foul at this point is a baddish one on Bobby Charlton around 20 minutes and uh, the referee, uh, Creedlin, runs over and just reprimands the Argentinian straight away. What's that name again? Creedlin. I'm going to say it's that. We may have to remember that later. Yeah, there will be many pronunciations of that. Yeah, that was around 20 minutes in, but uh, uh, what, five or so minutes later, they're starting to ramp up in regularity, these fouls now. The players, though, don't seem, they're not going... Are you going to do something? No, not at all. They're just, they're keen, they seem kind of keen to just to just get on with it anyway. Uh, but we get somebody in the book around that time, 25 minutes um, in the book, not given a yellow card. That's a note for you all to home, uh, at home to note yeah. um, because we'll uh, recap later. Um, so Solari looks to shield the ball from Bobby Charlton and he kind of pushes him off the ball to keep it. Yeah. Uh, Charlton went in, stood up still, uh, everyone thinks Creedlin awards Argentina a free kick, but he's given it to England. Yeah, and uh, and Solari just kind of shrugs and gently just kicks the ball away. Uh, the camera cuts in close to the referee. who must see or hear something, and he just rushes over straight away and books uh, Solari, who doesn't complain, just wanders back. And I thought he must have said something to just shout it at him because it was kind of dealt with the incident. The incident's done. And the referee, something happens, which sets the referee off, and he's like, right, that's a book in now. Yeah, you don't caution. Want you don't want to give uh, you don't want to give this man too much sass. No, <laughs> not at all. No, it's worth remembering that at the time. You know, just these players don't go down easily, and they aren't looking for fouls, so it makes it a bit more difficult to 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 think about what is a yellow, what is a foul, what is a penalty, because the players aren't playing for it. No, not at all. No, they're ready to just stand up, and and I, I think I think it's psychologically, whereas now they go. What, what's, Sod psychologically, we could be one the up if we dive. Every t- yeah, every two minutes, there's an excuse and a need to go and go, go around the referee and be like, oh, "Have you seen this? I can't believe it." And it is. It's probably- Whereas here, I think they're more like, "I'm not letting him tackle me to the floor because then he's got the better of me." Exactly. And, yeah, exactly. Um, up to this point, we're about thirty minutes in now. Uh, Argentina, as we mentioned, the loving back, sitting back and keeping it slow. It's really even, um, and the fails have been quite manageable, but. They're ramping up again. It's not even really, it's not even really a game a come around the 30 minute mark. I think it's just fells, 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 fells. Yeah, I, th- I think England are a bit rushed at this point as well. They've kind of lost their heads a little bit. They've started well and then all of a sudden there's a lot of fouls, a lot of like niggly stuff and England start losing the ball pretty badly at this point. They don't really know what they're doing. Their game plan's gone out the window. Yeah, it, it's. I think. Yeah, is is Arge, is Argentina's game plan going well though? Do you think their game plan is? They're loving it. I think they're loving it at this point because actually, when they play the ball, they are a very skilled team. They kind of unveil themselves as being good passers. They know what they're doing with the ball. They're all in a good shape and all that. And and kind of before you even realise it, you're in the middle of a storm that is this game that has been slowly creeping in. Yeah, <laughs> don't realise you're there until you're inside it. Really, I mean. One of the players, Rattan, you can spot him straight away because he's about five foot tall than every other player on the pitch. <laughs> and basically, Bobby Charlton runs through the middle and Rattan tries to bring him down, but Charlton rides the challenge, continues, has a shot, easily saved, kind of thing, no problem. You then go and uh, as the goalkeeper, Rome, is in goal for Argentina, he throws the ball out to his teammate and then the camera cuts back and Creetlin cautions Rattan. Rattan doesn't even register. It's like he's just been told it's a Saturday and he already knew that. (laughs) It's just doesn't even bother. He just starts walking off. And then minutes later, near the touchline, Rattan, again, is very late on one of the players. And Hurst takes a tumble to the floor for England. And you can hear the crowd on both sets and both sets of the commentary, like chanting for off. Yeah. And Rattan just kind of points to himself, be like, me? (laughs) Like, what what are you on about? There's nothing to do with that. Yeah. Um, no caution, by the way, absolutely no, nothing wrong with that either. And it's just like, what do you, I mean, that's more of a booking than his first one. You'd probably say today that's a booking definitely, but even then you probably go, yeah, I can see you probably yeah. should be booked. And directly from that incident, more, uh, Bobby Moore takes the free kick for England, feeds it into Hunt. 
who gets clattered on the edge of the Argentina <laughs> area so by clattered. Perfumo. And it's another free kick to England. Meanwhile, Ratin is continuing to talk to the referee. Yeah, uh, he seems to be telling his own players to calm down as well. Like, have you not just seen what you've done? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. everybody else. Lead by example, mate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, England are ready to take the free kick and he, they can't find the ball, the ref can't, and the Argentinians are keeping it behind their back, <laughs> like hiding it away from them. And it looks like the ref has had enough as he sprints over to try and get the ball back off them. Yeah. But they've thrown it away, given it to England, and they won't move the wall back to take the free kick. It's it's it, it didn't. It felt like it was going to reach a boiling point this game, but it just goes from like fifty percent towards boiling point to boiling point so quick. And by yeah. now, I was watching. I was going, "What is going to happen? <laughs> like, what possibly could happen?" It's like a film where you just know there's another twist coming. It's yeah, like, yeah, what yeah. is this? That's not the end. That's yeah. not the end at all. I'm having that. Do you only watch up to that bit? Do you not stick around <laughs> for the next bit? It is. Crazy. So he's, he's trying to get the wall to move back the appropriate amount as well. That, that I mean, the very at a very inappropriate distance, aren't they? They're just right by the ball. Oh, was, right by the ball. Yeah, and and Creedlin kind of brings asks them to come back. They don't do it, so he marches over to book one of them. But before he can do that, England have taken the free kick and it's gone wide. So they're already furious at this, and because he can't get the, the ball to move back, he then I think it's yeah they get a goal. Argentina get a goal kick at this point, and they take the goal kick. But the camera is on the fullback, and all of a sudden there's a roar from the crowd, and Cretan's run over and he's booked Rattan again and he sent him off. Oh. So he must have been the one in the wall, and he was telling all of his players, you calm down, and he's still talking to the referee, but he's then saying, Well, don't move back. So he's like, Well, I've got to book someone, and it's gonna be you. Well, this is it. This is the turning point for the game. This is where things just go a bit mental. And no one really knows what's happened either at this point. Like you can see that Rattan's complaining with to the referee, and then all of a sudden, all the Argentina players are around the referee because they all go, he's not sent him off, has he? Yeah, yeah. Um, and with hindsight, let's have a look at it with hindsight now because this is an incident that's been debated and debated and debated over the years. Yeah. Um, Creetlin would later say, I sent Rattan off because he was following me and shouting at me. I had no option. He was trying to be the referee. Yeah. Which I think is fair enough. If, yeah, if that's his side of it, I mean, we're going to hear a lot of sides of, of this as well. I mean, on the commentary, um, <laughs> Waltham so says that Rattan has been dismissed for violence of the tongue, which is brilliant. All of this is fine, but they don't speak the same language. No. So you are actually just sending him off. Uh, apparently, you sent him off for the look on his face. Uh, well, that's what, Rat you, that's what Rattan said, isn't it? Ah, uh, right. But still, you... <laughs> It just, I guess it's more of a, a, almost a philosophical question than anything. Yeah. I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer, but should you be sending off players for, for verbals hmm. if you don't know what they're saying? He's not exactly going, I love you! Yeah, ex well, exactly. Oh, do you want to go for a pint? <laughs> yeah, he's not exactly saying that, is he? He's already been booked. He's already could have been booked for something else as well. And I think he was just sick of him, for, like you say, following around trying to referee the game as well. Whenever you send someone off, for not a bad tackle or something like that. Like if you send someone off for diving, it's always seen as, well, you know, it happens all the time. And yeah, one camp say that, the other one's like, good, you've got to stop that. But then you kind of get into the camp of, well, you know, you shouldn't verbally assault referee and shout at him and scream and all that. But how are you going to get that out of the game? And it's not really th much of a thing in football at this point. But if we've already seen that there's been chaos in a couple of the other Argentina games as well, yeah, this one's already kind of going mad. And by this point, the Argentina players are around the referee. I mean, they may even be pushing him at one point from what I could see. Like he's moving back very quickly. Yeah. And there's like a, a lot of arms thrown around too. And he's like, what's happening? You can't really see. It's a hard one to gauge for me. I mean, on one hand, there was a red card was going to happen. Mm. It was just going to happen. But yeah. Did he book, was he giving out yellows a bit too? I mean, he wasn't giving out yellow cards. Let's just establish this. Yeah. Maybe best to just do this little spoiler Let's now. Just, yeah. Um, yellow cards weren't a thing at this point. Yeah. This referee would go on to invent yellow cards as a way of clearing up this communication issue. Yeah, definitely. Um, so he was putting people in the book willy nilly early on, I think. I mean, there were bad, bad enough tackles, but... What's a foul? What's a, what's a, what's, let's just say, let's just call it yellow and red cards for ease now. What's a yellow card in this era? We just don't know. It no. seems like at times you get booked for certain things and not other things. Maybe they get a bit of leniency of accumulation, but then are you getting booked because something someone else has done? We're both of ratings for talking. 
So one was for the late challenge on Charlton. Oh, right. But apparently okay. he'd been following him around all game, saying like just in his, in his ears saying that. And then the other one, there was a bad tackle. He didn't get booked for. And then this one is for the verbals. And this goes back to how much do you believe in in the head of the Argentina team that they thought it was a conspiracy from the kickoff? Because you look at their South American rivals, you've got Pele being kicked from pillar to post. You've got mm. losing 3-1 to Hungary with two goals disallowed. Mm. Um, you've, you've got Pele coming back from injury and getting injured again. Yeah. And that was an English referee. Mm. This is a German referee. Um, this is a German referee, European, yeah. right? Yeah. But wasn't there an English referee in the Germany game at this stage as well. Yeah, so it's on the same day as well, Uruguay are playing West Germany. Against the South American team? That's yes, right. and apparently the Uruguayan and Argentinian, Argentinian referees used to travel together because they spoke the same language and it was a bit easier to get around. They were supposed to go to a meeting um, about the referees, about basically drawing who's going to referee one games. Rattan says that they got there on time, but they'd already done the draw and the West German referee was refereeing um, this game, and the English referee is refereeing the Uruguay game. Yeah, against West Germany. That's which is big conspiracy, and it's a lot of joining the dots, and you just don't know what went on at this point. I mean, they're using anything they can. There's things where they're saying, "Well, actually, they've done this." I mean, we've still got things like saying there's not enough press photographers here being as used yeah. an excuse. I mean, not by the Argentina, which is fair, but there's still lots of other stuff going on, and. Even more stuff starts going on as well but, now. But we don't even know the power of the World Cup at this time. Like, why would you set up a conspiracy to win it? Is it a commercial thing? Is it is it seen as almost like an extension of war and dominance mm. and just be going like... Colonialism or something yeah, like that? Yeah, like, or... why in the 60s, when football is just is what it is, is a popular sport, not a global phenomenon yeah. as such... I think. I think in be, comparison to today, I mean, definitely yeah. not. That's because of media and, and reach of it. Like you could totally imagine the, the merit in a conspiracy to win a World Cup now. It'd be almost impossible, I think, to achieve mm. unless it's just been done before my eyes. Um, <laughs> well, again, but with all this stuff, which is all the same with every conspiracy thing is, where's your evidence? Where's your proof? The amount of people that would have to like cover this stuff up as well. I mean, it's all come from the people who feel that they've been wronged in this situation of the South Americans. So, but, but was it a self-fulfilling thing? Did they come into this game thinking this guy's going to fuck us? And, yeah. and then just acted up so much that he was like, fucking hell, what is wrong with you, man? Yeah. Because they were so riled up. And but then they'd he, already had, they'd already said as well, that, and again, it's West German, so we've got to kind of look what we say about that as well. But they're saying that they were afraid to play because of what Argentina were doing. And they had a man sent off. And he was like, well, I thought I was going to get sent off for something else, actually. It's, yeah. It all keeps coming back, doesn't it? Of like... You can see where they put the pieces together, whether they make sense or not, is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Like, I personally don't think that, but I could see how someone else could put those pieces together and see something totally different. I think it's interesting. I think it's very interesting. <laughs> that's that's the ultimate sitting on the fence debate. Yeah. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. But um, we, we go back to the action and it's not football action because there's <laughs> a long time before we see any football. Um, it all kicks off. Yep. Ratting goes over to the um, Argentina coach, Juan Carlos Lorenzo, and the rest of the coaching staff. They're, they're getting on. They're getting in the mix. Uh, England's players have since said Ratting was waving his players to come off the pitch. So uh, everyone's kind of just, like, everyone's bundled into one corner. There are so many people involved, and it's one of those you think, who's actually in control? I was watching, yeah. I was thinking, who's going to make this stop? Where's yeah. the voice of authority of here? here? Because it's not the referee. No. What, and is some bloke from the FA going to come down and sort of, like, yeah. what solve is that? This? Nobody, nobody's going to care about him. It's like flipping, if, you, if you're in a bank and you think, well, I want to see the bank manager. He's got all the power in here. And then two blokes with shotguns and masks <laughs> come in and you're like, well, there's been a bit of a power shift. Hasn't there <laughs> yeah. now? These guys are the most important people in the room. And they, and they, the Argentina team try and do that. I mean, the scenes on the touchline are amazing. It's like something from the Sopranos. There's just loads of men in track suits just walking over yeah. and all having big opinions and gestures and lots of discussion, as we say. I mean, it feels like there's about 30 people on the touchline. It, it, you know what it needed? It needed um, a bit of uh, Jeff from the League of Gentlemen to break all this yeah. up. So you're just arguing, 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 and then you need someone to go, 
you know I got this gun, don't you? <laughs> just, that's a leveler. Yeah, that's gonna uh, that's gonna diffuse things clearly, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's just gone crazy. I mean, while they're arguing with the ref, Rattan just walks back to the centre circle and refuses to go off. And the referee at some point decides he's had enough of it, doesn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He just picks up the ball, puts it back on the pitch, and they're like, "No, no, you're not. You're 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 involved still at this point." I mean. What's later been described as a committee meeting is taking place on the touchline. The FIFA referee liaison, uh, Ken Aston, comes over and he's talking to the Argentina coach. It's actually become like wrestling. Yeah. Like the commission has got to come out to sort all this out or something. <laughs> the, uh, Ken Aston is he and the referee were the t- duo who later invented yellow cards and whatever. Ah, there you go. You could, yeah, because Ken Aston sticks out because he's the only guy in a suit. Everyone's either got the leisure wear on or they've got the kit, a kit on basically. And it, it comes quite clear. We're not sure whether Aston speaks Spanish. I wouldn't imagine that he would. Why would he? Well, no, but so, so what's, what good's he doing there? But I think Rattan later said he's asked for a translator. So maybe Aston did speak Spanish. And that's why he's come down to go, all right, I'll translate what's going on then. Wasn't the translator thing what he said that he got sent off for? He was like, that's what I was saying at the time. Yeah, what bollocks. I'm sorry, <laughs> but oh, I, I was only shouting for a translator. I was like, what? Get me a fucking translator. I mean... What on earth? I mean, there's another FIFA bigwig that comes in at some point as well. And the crowd starts to clap and boo and ratting it to, to be removed. And, you know, what is going on? You hear Jimmy Hill in the commentary start, all you hear is you know, go, rules of the game, yeah. <laughs> which is amazing. It's about three minutes of this before the referee picks up the ball and walks yeah. back to the pitch of it, as I just mentioned. Um, like, like that's going to change anything. Yeah. It doesn't. Uh, you can hear the bit of commentary in the back, in the English commentary on the bed underneath. And, yeah, and, and they're going, yep, the referee's decided he's having nothing to do with it. <laughs> now, it's a bit late for that, isn't it? You can't remove yourself from the field of conflict now, can you? <laughs> You've already done too much. And um, yeah, I mean, with all this going on, it is eight minutes before we're back underway playing. And well, before Rattan actually leaves the pitch. Yeah. he's He then walks down... I think there's clips of him walking down the touchline. So I don't know where he's going because I thought he'd be going back to the changing rooms, which are by the benches, but maybe they're on the other side of the pitch. I'm not sure for Argentina, but he's walking down the side of the pitch and he says that a lot of the English fans are like throwing cans at him and shouting and swearing. So he starts giving it back to them. And there's a lovely yeah. bit in a documentary I saw where there's a, he walks past like a corner flag and it's got like a, um, like a union Jack on it. Yeah. with like, we'll cut Willie in the middle. Yeah. And he just like gets the corner of it and squeezes yeah. and twists it. He's like, Oh, revenge. Yeah. yeah. Even that feels like an English thing to do. Doesn't it? Like so really petty. reserved and just, yeah. No anger's actually been released or anything like <laughs> that. Uh, so yeah, he left the pitch. We're back. Um, and we are back on the way. Um, okay. 20 seconds later, uh, Jeff Hurst goes in hard on Ferrero, <laughs> who's rolling, he's rolling around the, f- oh my God, he, he's doing like the, the exaggerated fantasy football league, yeah, so kind yeah. of rolling around on the floor. You know what people who don't like football yeah. says every footballer is like, and they're like rolling and a swan dive and the arms are out and all that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, but for God's sake. I mean, that is too much. It is a hard challenge by Hurst. I will absolutely say that. It's clearly a foul. Again, who knows what a booking is? There's no way of knowing. But my word, that is that is a lot, isn't it? I and mean, all the be- Argent... Go on. I was just saying, all the Argent League players see that and they're just like, whoa, they just run over to <laughs> yeah. him again and be like, well, what are you going to do about this? Imagine if you sent him off for that. <laughs> sent off the bloke rolling around. No, oh, I meant Hurst. Oh, that would have been good though. Yeah, no chance of that. Mm. Uh, the last bit of action for the half is another foul. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's another, there's another uh, at one point, there's an, another one comes together. Creetlin ends up on the floor himself as well at this point. So as Moore's kind of falling in, he pushes Creetlin who goes into the back of an Argentina player and he's on the floor and the Argentina players are thinking, you're fouling us now. Yeah. And that's half time, man. We're finally there. <laughs> <laughs> A lot went on that half. Not, any football? No, not, there was not, a shot. Past a, that not past a certain point. It is just just craziness that went on there. I mean, I can't even remember if he, there's injury time, if that's a thing at this point, but he probably just like get to half time and go. And in re, after a steady half for Argentina, they kind of got England where they wanted them and they kind of had played their own game a bit too much, I think, at this point to get Rattan sent off. Yeah, yeah. Today, they're a bit more clever about that, about rotating fouls. And well, actually, if we need to do that, you don't foul him because you're going to come off and we'll bring on another person who's not been booked. So we can do that. Or a certain player will close down 
a different player to bring them down for a tactical foul. And yeah, it's just cost them really. They're a bit too clever, I think. Would, would oh, maybe a bit too clever for it, but has it cost them because England are better than they may have anticipated and therefore their frustrating game has been frustrated? Does that um, make sense? I, I know exactly what you mean. I don't disagree, but I would also say that England have been rattled by this. Like yeah. there's like by the time it, after the first 15 minutes, England don't really produce anything. There's no really, really good passing. There's no chances. There's not, there's a lot of lofty crosses into the box. There's not really anything else. And I think it really shocks England where they kind of go, all right, let's get to half time. Let's go out and we'll try and change something now. And we'll get to that. Let's get into the second half. Yeah. Uh, with the extra man advantage, Bobby Moore is pretty much playing in midfield now. And uh, the half starts with Jeff Hurst having a good effort saved by Roma. Uh, from the resulting corner, big Jack Charlton. He's in there. Goes up for a header with the keeper. Both of them end up, end up on the floor. <laughs> and four Argentina players come over to kick him <laughs> uh, until he's a uh, big brother. Um, little brother, surely. Uh, I think so, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think Jack's older. Yeah, so his little brother, uh, Bobby, comes over and pushes them away and breaks it up. And just more fouls, more fouls, more fouls, more fouls. Yeah, it keeps going, doesn't it? And Argentina are really happy to to just sit in, soak up the pressure and get forward where they can, preying on the England nerves. I mean, there's quite a few incidences when they do get, do get the ball forward and England do commit that foul they were doing in the first half. But the problem is Argentina are even more happy now to take the time, bring people forward, slow the game down and, and prey on those nerves. I mean, yeah, and... and it's not like England are really making that one-man advantage pay much. No, absolutely not. They're, they've kind of gone and they're kind of going, well, what are we supposed to do? They've, they've kind of run out of ideas because they're in a situation they don't want to be in. There's been a lot of pressure on them after the slow start against Uruguay and they've not really been seen in the press as they've picked up and they're delivering on expectations at the World Cup so far. So imagine a frustrating start to a campaign and then you've got this, the pressure then to beat 10 men when they're as clever as they are and as good as they are. Yeah. It feels like we need it. We need something to break the, uh, break the, the, the system up, man. Yeah. England need to shake this game up to do something. I mean, the best chance actually comes from a counter attack from Argentina. So when England attack fizzles out and there's a, um, for England, and there's a lovely outside of the ball, outside of the boot over the top pass from Gonzalez and sends Oscar Mass through he kind of sees Banks like slightly off his line. He takes a shot and Banks saves it around the post, but it was a really good chance. He's kind of one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. Banks does well to come out early, but you think maybe given a bit more time, he could have done something with it. And that's pretty much the best chance of the half. Yeah. Well, the game continues as, as it has. Uh, a lot of fouls, a lot of kind of decent football when, when you can find it. Yeah, you know? when you can scrat around and try and find it. But we to say not anything noteworthy is going on. It's just a pattern of press and repeat. You hear a lot today about games with uh, players with teams with 10 men who try and get through a half of football or whatever. It's like, right, you take it in 10 minute periods. Let's see if this works or this works. And you take it bit by bit. Argentina are doing that so, so well. And like I say, they just need something, don't they, England? Um, yeah. Uh, well, we get to about 70, 75, 76 minutes. And at this point, uh, listener, we interrupt this fight to bring you news of... A goal. Martin Peter recibió de Wilson el centro al punto de penalti. Hurst gol. El gol de Hurst tras el centro de Martin Peters. Por una vez lo hizo fenomenalmente Martin Peters centrando muy bien con Rosca con la pierna izquierda desde también el carril. Wow. Relief. Wow. England are... Well, actually, we have to tell the audience because <laughs> that is not English commentary. In, yeah, it's relief. England are winning. It's happened. It's finally happened. The breakthrough has come and it's Jeff Hurst. Um, a, what, a lovely goal. Yeah, a great, great edit. After what must be the 58th cross England have put in into the box, finally found an England head. I think it's Martin Peters who crosses in from the left and Hurst is free for the first time. Running across the goal, leaps, heads it into the far corner, one nil England, and and such a good header. Oh yeah. man! To get away from his marker, to flick it into the the only place that Roma can't really reach at that point as well. Do um, you know um, side Bobby Moore? Uh, Bobby Moore. Bobby Charlton said that that goal is the best England goal he saw while ah, as a player. Very um, nice. Feels like a bit of a, a hipster's pick. Yeah, you know what my goal actually is? It that he, my favourite Jeff Hurst goal? No, none of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. None of those ones. Probably the most relief um, he felt from a goal. Well, I get, you've gone through so much at this point and you've gone through Argentina and what you think is their, their tactics, which you're not pleased with, and you've totally lost your heads. And then you've got to, 
you've got a break in terms of this is what you needed. It's not a bit of luck. It's a good bit of play. And they've just got that little bit of space where maybe Argentina have, have kind of waned. I mean, Martin Peters is just doing a roly-poly after it goes in as well. He kind of breaks <laughs> away. Even like Gordon Banks runs up to celebrate with his teammates. I mean, I don't think in this period I've ever seen a goalkeeper run up to celebrate. And that's how big this is. No, and uh, even in the midst of celebration, Argentina are trying to... Pick a fight with Gordon Banks. <laughs> I wouldn't do that at all, would you? <laughs> but they just get there pushed off. Um, probably, probably harsh actually. Mm, yeah, on Argentina, the goal. Um, they've done really well considering the disadvantage of ten men, and um, it's been so even. Well, I guess somebody has to score. Somebody has to win. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, there's you know her goal. England don't exactly keep the ball well. Uh, after the goal either they're, they're looking to score another and it you know more and jack charlton are dealing with everything that's coming in the air as they previously well they kind of had been messing around with it almost conceding silly fouls but now they seem like they've been switched on they're ready for it and and england do seem to calm down a little bit more in the in the last five minutes and they're just looking to soak up a last bit of pressure here if argentina can do anything else una admirable actitud de Argentina buscando el partido. Final. Final del partido de Inglaterra 1. Argentina 0, Inglaterra semifinalista. Un partido que va a ser recordado no por el buen fútbol, sino sobre todo por la gran polémica. Varió el gol de Jeff Hart en el 32 de la segunda parte de Inglaterra, como decíamos, a semifinal. And it's over. Yeah. Breathe a sigh of relief. We've all got our legs. Our bones are intact. <laughs> My kneecaps were where they were when we started. Yeah, now let's get the... Okay, my, my groin's not being kicked in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the drama continues, obviously, at full time. The yeah. referee gets a bit of a shellacking, shall we say. Yeah, at the end of the match, uh, the Argentina players surround referee Creetlin, um, who has his shirt ripped by Ferrero, uh, earning the player a three-match ban. Uh, Creetlin's escorted from the pitch, surrounded by police. Uh, we'll share this photo on the socials, but in the photo, Creetlin looks ill. He looks like he's aged like 70 years since the start yeah, of the game. He's he like, really does. He looks like he should have like a drip next to him. But you can <laughs> see in the background uh, that Aston bloke is like escorting him off yeah. as well with the police. Yeah. Uh, after the game, um, his comments were, I just want to forget the whole dreadful experience. That match was the roughest I have ever refereed. It was terrible. A disgrace. I sent Ratting off because he was following me and <laughs> shouting at me. I had no option. He was trying to be the referee. Uh this all prompted a bit of a deep dive from myself into Creetlin and um, really quite interesting, actually. Um, consider this first fact when um, we, we just said the match was the roughest I have ever refereed. Mm. Uh, he set up and refereed football matches in an American prisoner of war camp, oh, God. <laughs> which uh, sparked his love for the role. <laughs> Although I suppose they wouldn't have been rough to each other if they're all prisoners of war. Yeah, they're probably just desperate to get out at that point. They're not really going to kick each other, are they, if they're the same camp? <laughs> uh, after the war, he was a, a tailor. Um, he'd been called up for military service. Um, and so, like, he wasn't, like, you know, seeking out the... The, the limelight. Yeah, no, not the limelight, like, being a soldier. Oh, right. He, okay. he wasn't, like, a military type. He, he had to go to war and ended up being a prisoner of war. And he, he eventually became known as the brave little tailor. Well, I tell you, a reference to his non-war or football career. Well, he's really stitched up the Argentinians here, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> we did it. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Uh, no, I don't have one. I thought that was one. <laughs> um, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, this shit show uh, led to uh, Creetlin and Ken Aston combining their knowledge to create red and yellow cards to enable better communication on the pitch. But it wasn't his last controversy. Okay. A year after this, he was refereeing a Colm v Hanover league match. Uh, he dismissed Hanover fan favourite Jürgen Bandura for being patronising toward him. <laughs> again, again uh, no snark. Imagine being sent off for being patronising. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. have you got a yellow, have you? Yeah, does, isn't that the same as like, didn't Ronaldo get sent off for the clap? Isn't there a clapping? Oh, uh, Rooney's done that before, hasn't really? he? Rooney did the big clap and he got another yellow for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so how that came about was there was a free kick given, they were sorting out the distance um, and Bandura proceeded to demonstrate to Creetlin just exactly how to measure 10 yards distance between a ball and a wall. <laughs> and that was enough for him. He saw red and then the other guy saw red. Oh my God. Um, but furious Hanover fans harassed him for weeks uh, after this with a, a barrage of telephone threats, threatening to kidnap his son and, oh, bur Jesus. and burn down his tailor shop in Stuttgart. <laughs> Uh, so re he retired the following season. I think he should retire and just move, wouldn't he? Just go go anywhere that's not Argentina or West Germany at that point. Yeah. 
Poor bloke. Yeah, life kind of ruined, but I guess he's kind of got previous as well, or he's got, he will have more. Like, what do you mean? I mean? Just like his style. Like, if, it's not just this game, is it really? Like, <laughs> it's like he's, he's still doing stuff in other places. Um, it's just like, yeah, it is his style. He does not like being uh, spoken to in that, in that way. And you know, like a teacher or something. And most of the time, I guess you just, yeah, like a teacher. Yeah. Some people can handle it and they're just like, oh, whatever. Some people give it back and say, peace off. I mean, it's not, He it's reaches not, for the red. Yeah, well, it's not as, like in rugby and all that, we've got to call the referee sir or whatever the hell they're doing that rubbish. <laughs> he, uh, he died in uh, 2012. Oh, really? Okay, then. Yeah, so uh, a long life and uh, some happy moments. Some, yeah, <laughs> I mean, not this one. Um, Amongst being a prisoner of war. Uh, <laughs> I probably prefer that to this from his honest. game and his game in Germany. If you go on his Wikipedia, uh, it goes Rudolf Kretlin, uh, 14th November 1919 to 31st of July 2012, was a German international football referee active in the 1960s. Section one, England v Argentina, 1966 <laughs> World Cup. Bang. That's before a section called career. Oh, wow. So that this, really just, this does really overshadow his career. Wow, yeah. I mean, what while we say this, it's still going on on the pitch, by the way. Yeah. Stuff is still <laughs> happening. So uh, Argentine player Onega is also received a three-match ban for spitting at uh, FIFA vice president uh, Harry Cavan. I don't know when he came on the pitch. Good on him. Good on him. Give him FIFA a little spit. <laughs> yeah. Um, how they even cross paths amazes me. I assume that Cavan was on the side of the pitch when all this is kicking off. Um and then probably the most famous thing that people know this game for, or may not, maybe they don't even know it from this game, but they know it happened. Uh, George Cohen goes to swap shirts with an op his opposite number, but Alf Ramsey runs onto the pitch to try and stop him from doing so. Uh, he succeeds and uh, pulls the shirt uh, back to Cohen. So the Argentina player just walks around him and swaps it with a different England player. Yeah, that's very, very Ramsey, isn't he? Mm. Like, you will not be trading shirts with these animals. Yeah, well... That's literally pretty much what he calls them afterwards as well. Uh, later in an interview with the people, Ramsey says, we have still to produce our best football. It will come against the right type of opposition. The team who come out to play, not act as animals. And the animals cut is synonymous with this game. Yeah, it was right. The fans were singing it at the start, weren't they? Yeah, so I don't know where that's come from either. I don't I don't know where I that is. But like you say, a bit, a bit, not racism kind of so kind of yeah just that dehumanizing yeah. people and yeah. but why they're from south america yeah but they probably wouldn't have said it to brazil <sighs> yeah you don't know but maybe there's this reputation that comes with argentina again maybe they'd seen what happened in the tournament and they'd been watching it or heard about mm. it or read about it in the paper of like oh they're a dirty team so you've got your pre-assumptions with it as well yeah uh even off the pitch the uh the aggro continues an unnamed argentinian <laughs> player urinated in the tunnel uh, a chair was thrown into the England dressing room. Um, I think that was Vince McMahon. Uh, the Argentinian squad then attacked... The Argentinian squad... <laughs> let's just take that as... A, wow. The Argentinian squad then attacked the England bus. Not the fans. Oh, my God. And when, <laughs> and when someone tried to stop them, uh, whoever it was that tried to stop them, the, their reward was getting half an orange squeezed in their face. <laughs> God. Just anything is a weapon at that point, isn't it? <laughs> like a no holds barred match. Just yeah. going back there. Imagine that. They've squeezed an orange in my face, not even a lemon. Oh, straight to A and E for you. Yeah. Oh, my face is sticky. <laughs> Can you imagine the unknown player who urinated in the tunnel? Uh who was it? Uh I'm not gonna say, but it's I'm gonna call him Catin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um imagine the guys though, but like there in in the thing going, Do you wanna um should we have a share? Like well, you can have a share if you want me and the rest of the lads are going to go and kick the shit okay. out of their bus. I watched a um, a bit of a, a documentary about this as well, about this game. And I think it's George Cohen who was just like, let him in. <laughs> <laughs> just chilling. Was like, cause he was like, well, there was a few that were smaller than me, so I'd just go for them. No <laughs> they way. they were huge. I mean, again, Ratin would still be knocking around at this point too. They are physically tip top. <laughs> yeah. Um, they all, they've all got like six packs and what have you. And it's not just skinny man six packs as well you can tell they're like strong and physical yeah um the observers hugh McIlvenny described what had just happened uh, as not so much a football match more of an international incident yeah and the mirrors peter wilson known as the man they can't gag Ooh. wrote i uh, know oh yeah oh try and silence me you sheep yeah, try that <laughs> he wrote uh, this is sporting anarchy soccer in chaos uh, warfare for national aggrandizement run riot he also referred to Argentina as safe American bandits and, bad. <laughs> and said the team should be banned for four years. Bad bandits. 
They didn't take anything. They, yeah, they didn't escape with anything, did they? they? If anything, they lost half an orange. <laughs> <laughs> they one half orange down. <laughs> all of the bottoms, just like, that was my orange. It wasn't all one-sided, though. Uh, some British press, uh, including Maurice Smith, wrote that he felt sorry for these perplexed Argentinians. They scarcely deserved this. And we step into the aftermath of the aftermath. So of we, we the game. finally stepped away from Wembley Stadium. Yeah, we, we we've been there so long watching this fight, <laughs> and we've got we finally go into go. Okay, like pressure off now. Yeah, kind of looking through it with like a different view, maybe of what was happening bang straight at the time on that day. So yeah. Um, Argentina went into full-on conspiracy mode. Uh, the game is known as El Robo del Siglo, or, for our English listeners, the robbery of the century. <laughs> At this point, England have been a part of the game of the century and the robbery of the century, so <laughs> really shaping up to be our century, guys. Yeah. And they played the team of the century as well. They were yeah. making a, a lot of big shouts about the century in the 60s, weren't they? Well, isn't it? It's never going to get better. Yeah, you're only like about 66% of the way through. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, about. <laughs> yeah. Argentina captain uh, Ratin later said it was clear that the referee played with an England shirt on um, and said he wasn't arguing with the referee, as we mentioned earlier, but he was asking for an interpreter instead. A spokesman for the Argentinian FA said, I do not approve of the conduct of our players and officials, which is fair enough. Mm -hmm. Very measured. Yeah. Um, and he then follows on um, from that with, but... Always a but. Yeah. They were provoked by the referee. He was absolutely biased in favour of England. The referee and those who selected him were, in my view, responsible for the trouble. Yeah, well, that's his opinion. It's getting it's getting worse, really. It's, yeah, as it goes on, we're still into the murky waters here. I mean, when FIFA uh, met up to consider its reaction to the quarterfinal, uh, the head of the Argentina delegation, uh, Juan Santiago, called the English FIFA president, Stan Rouse, a moron. <laughs> If we're sticking with a personal insult, uh, the referee doesn't get away scot-free. In the Sunday Times, Brian Glanville described uh, Creetlin as a small man strutting potentously about the field, bald, brown head gleaming in the sunshine. That's bad, isn't it? A brown head. Um, as, as he put name after Argentinian name into his notebook. Uh, one was reminded of a schoolboy collecting railway engine numbers. It's a different what, time. I mean, what a square. I know, yeah. <laughs> Bald brown head. That's so bad. I know, yeah. Uh, the match report read, the Argentine tactics were simple. Slow walking football and short passing, clearly designed to disrupt England's play. The game, uh, the game spiralled into a kicking contest, which overwhelmed the German referee, Kretelin. I would say it did overwhelm him. And yeah. If we well, his comments at the end of the game, he hated it. Yeah, I, I hate being here. Yeah. I'd rather be anywhere else but here. I mean... Looking at it, he could have maybe dealt with it differently. But as we say, if he can't speak their language and there's no way of saying, I mean, he, they can watch him putting them in the book. So surely they know what's going on. He's not just going, all right, shopping list. Uh, what am I doing later? Like, <laughs> like they know what's happening. He's writing down their name. Because at one point he asks a player on camera to turn around to take his number. So they know they're in the book, but they yeah. keep doing this. And again, that it's not developed into the rotation of fouls yet. So they're still accumulating them and, that, yeah, he, he kind of does as best he can, but you'd want better still. Um, Eusebio would go on to say uh, the referee always seemed to see only the worst faults of the Argentinian players and could not see the faults of the England players. Now, do you remember when I asked you about the um, the, the fell stats? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know the fell stats for this game? Uh, I, I did see them, actually. What are they? Uh, so, Argentina... Um, 18 fouls during the game, which I think is equal with a Premier League record for an individual team's most fouls in a game. Oh, and really? I, think it was, I think it was last year or the year before, I think Norwich got it. Okay. Um, England, 30 fouls. <laughs> 30 fouls. That's a lot, isn't it? They 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 were the dirtier team. But you wouldn't think, is it, watching that game, you wouldn't really think it, would you? No. There's, there's a lot of fouls that I say get given for. Well, it's a Bobby Moore handball, which is just unexplainable. Um, yeah. there's a lot of kind of little tactical fouls. There's a lot of balls over the top and Jack Charlton's kind of against the uh, Argentina forward and the forward goes down. I don't think he's really diving, but he goes down and collects a foul. Is that Creetlin kind of maybe overcorrecting? <sighs> Look, there was a massive error or whatever I've done here. I've got to give a few more of these or I don't, I don't really know. It's shocking to see that England committed 30 fouls in that game. Like they just kind of got erased from the memory. Yeah. 
so there's, there is something there in fairness we have, we have to say where, where it is let's continue with argentina's uh, sort of aftermath um the argentinian fa actually started to talk openly about leaving fifa fifa altogether <laughs> Uh, they uh, one official said, "I am not in a position to say we will split with FIFA and organise our own competition, but we are definitely in favour of this move." <laughs> I felt England were favoured. This became obvious as the competition developed. Um, before they left England, the Argentinians received a telegram from Argentina club side Club Universidad de Chile, uh, sending best wishes to the moral champions of world football. Uh, horrible. We're the moral champions. We're the real champions. Yeah, in this instance. This is the real championship, this is. You think you're the winners? Well, we've got the Moral Cup. Oh, it's like the second place trophy. Just sod off. And they were met with a hero's welcome when they got home. Thousands of people at the airport chanting Argentina Champione. Uh, the players were taken direct to the president who thanked them for the way they represented the nation. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be massive pricks, just be massive pricks about it. I mean, that's kind of what got to be rewarded. I mean... This is all the definition of what we talk, talked about today being shit housing, wouldn't you? Oh, God, this yeah. This is kind of where it feels like it's almost invented in my eyes. Yeah. Uh, the last word on Argentina's aftermath goes to the Captain Ratin, who um, has continued. He, he's like he's like somebody with a... Uh, I don't want to slag him off because he had a really good career, but it's like a one-hit wonder, mm. and he will still talk about this at every given opportunity. Almost like how, how you like Peter Shilton, and we we'll always talk about the Maradona stuff. Oh, yeah, he'll just go on about that every two minutes. So, like, Shilton, he's there in, like, the front of a, like, a newspaper with, like, his goalie gloves on with a ball, like, with the face of... Mm. On, uh, so, when asked on the 50th anniversary of the game if he would visit England again, he said, I'd like to be taken back there. I'd get off the plane, go and see the new Wembley, Chat with Bobby Charlton again. Go and see the Queen, who is still alive, <laughs> and come back home. He doesn't seem that angry about it. Fifty years later, it seems yeah. like he's like kind of looking forward to it. I like, will go back and cause another scene if you want. So uh, the aftermath for England, then. Hmm. Me imagines that uh, things might get a little bit tasty. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so Bobby Moore insisted that the Argentinians did do nasty things. Uh, they did tug your hair, spit at you, poke in your eyes and kick you when, the, when they were miles away from the ball. He said to his teammates, I just said the only way to deal with them is to beat the bastards. <laughs> it's a really good attitude. That <laughs> is a winner's attitude. It, it really is. And he said that's, that, that will hurt them. And really, that's what does hurt them. If they'd have won this game, they would have never talked about this. If they'd have, like, if they'd have put that chance away when they had it and if the first goal never happens, this whole gets... the gets taken aside and they look at it totally different of look what we overcame and they probably won't even hear about what, what they were wronged by doing because the winners write history really don't they <laughs> they certainly do mate yeah. and england march on they play portugal in the uh, semi-final i mean they must have felt like we've seen it all now you know yeah. we they, yeah. they, they must have had a lot of confidence uh, they beat portugal 2-1 uh, to face uh, is it west germany in the final west and germany. we kind of all know what happens there we'll cover that game at some point in the future peoples nick uh, was this england this this crazy game was it england it was certainly argentina wasn't it yeah it was so argentina um yeah, yeah they're playing the hits and their incredible back catalog and just can't help but quite love them for it actually oh like, i do quite I, I enjoy all of the stupidness when it's not happening to you when it's your team that you're watching you just can't help but hate it but yeah i, I quite enjoy it and we can kind of laugh about it now too um, england grinding out a win like this in any, any era is so unlikely especially with against 10 men i think this just would not be england and yeah i'm just more amazed that england players didn't kick off as well they were quite reserved throughout yeah, uh, for me, was this England? Yeah, it's that stiff upper lip, mm -hmm. and it's this showing. Yeah, you know we can do it, and it's a, and it's England World Cup at Wembley. Yeah, um, I think that that's pretty much it then for the show, uh, listeners. If you want to get in touch, we're on social media at isvis underscore England, and you can also email us at isvisenglandpod at gmail dot com. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. time